be here. Um, uh, I, wish, I wish Jer could be here with us. He's a Jer, if any of you saw Jer in 2009-11, he's now a father. He has a nine-month-old child. He's finding that life changes when you have a child. <laughs> they, they went with the seven-month-old child to Paris for a week. They discovered that was not a good idea. Um, <laughs> but uh, they're having a good time. I want to talk about value. My passion for about the last 30 years is how do we get value from the use of technology? And quite frankly, the track record of organizations using technology to get value is not great. <laughs> and we're now moving into an era where, tech, where digital is everywhere. And if we continue to do the same thing, we're going to have more wastes of, of money. And it's not the money. One of my passions is healthcare. Um, one of my favorite projects is the National Program for IT and Health in the UK. It's the biggest disaster ever in history, I think, for IT projects. But it's not the cost, but it's the taxpayer I'd be pissed off about. But it's how many people died? How many people have suffered? How many people have suffered unnecessarily because the healthcare system didn't get fixed <laughs> over that time? Well, that's the thing that I care about. I care about money, too. So I'll tell you a bit about myself. First of all, this is in my home office. I, this is where I work in Victoria, Canada. Uh, I have had a home office for 30 years. I've not had an office in, a, in an office building other than a, rent, a sort of walk-in one for 30 years. And I certainly couldn't do that without technology. Uh, technology is certainly changing the way we live, the change we work, the way we work, changing our society. But I don't think we're anywhere near realizing the value we can get from technology. Going back to healthcare again, I joined IBM in Canada from IBM Australia in 1974, and that was going to be the year of the electronic health record. We're not quite there, you know? Uh, so I, I, I think if we're going to succeed in the digital era, we have to learn from the previous era. So I, I give you my value journey. Being a value journey, it started with 30 pounds. I uh, came back from school in East Africa, decided education wasn't really for me, and then decided that maybe I should get a better education. So I took a day release job with Kiwi Boot Polish. I can't imagine my future would have been with Kiwi Boot Polish. Um, but I'd, 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 I'd uh, applied to another job which said energetic, able, young man required, and I applied anyway. And, and, <laughs> and they, I turned up, and they, they gave me some sort of aptitude test. I don't know what it was, but obviously I passed it. And I got this panel of three people interviewing me and said, well, we'll let you know. I said, well, I've got this other job. I've got to let them know by Friday. So, so they sent me a telegram. Anyone remember <laughs> telegrams? You know, offer of, and it was 30 pounds more than the job I'd been offered before. So 30 pounds got me into this. I had no idea what the job was, by the way. They didn't tell me. I just thought I would go to the job. So uh, I, they, I, I got to there, and, and they said, oh, the 1401 is in the room down there. If anyone's been to Bletchley, they have two of these machines. I was going to be a computer operator on the 1401. This was an 8K machine. It was in a room about half the size of this room, <laughs> 8K. I was the operating system. There wasn't an operating system. I cleaned the card readers, the punches, the tape. And then after a few weeks, I thought, how does this thing work? And I started reading the books, and I started writing, writing code, and I went from being a, a t an operator to a programmer to a system programmer through, through, and through, and then I went through into my... Uh, into my uh, manager years, I joined, I joined uh, IBM and became a, I became, eventually became a systems engineering manager and a field support center manager. I don't know if they even have those anymore. And then I went into my consulting years, and I'm now still really doing that. And I ended up, from my home, managing the consulting practice worldwide of Fujitsu, not, not with the management consulting. So I'm a great believer in working from home, because you know, we don't have to go somewhere to work now. The work can come to where we are. Okay. Um, and now I'm the sort of evangelist for value. You can be the terminator. So back to Jeremy. The, I was saying how the world has changed. I think the subsequent to his being here, Jeremy was named Jer. I have to know he's called Jer. Um, we didn't call him Jer. Uh, <laughs> but he, he was named by National Geographic an emerging explorer in 2012, I think it was. You think, what? Emerging explorer? Because they, they, they've expanded their definition of explorer. He's exploring the boundaries of data. But when he went to Washington to be... Uh, inducted into this, into this, uh, into the um, fellow, into the emerging explorer thing, he met an actual explorer from South Africa, a guy called Steve Boys, who was active in trying to protect the, the Okavango, um, the Okavango Delta in Botswana. And next year, Jeremy, he said, I, but I have my trouble telling people what I'm doing. I really need to get our research information out. So Jeremy said, open data, I can help you with this. So next year, Jeremy was in the Okavango Delta, uh, lugging, uh, and, and I could see where he was because he had a track of where they were. I could see where they'd been, and if I clicked on those dots, I could see the research they got. And all of that stuff was being booted up 
live from this little computer <laughs> on the front of a dugout canoe, which they lugged through, the, through this, this countryside half the time because they couldn't go. And anyone in the world could access it using APIs. A little different version of exploration than we've seen before. So it's changing exploration. And I think we're also in an exploration era today. Change is unrelenting, you've all seen this. Everything and everyone connected all the time. I think sometimes all the time is a bit of a problem. I sometimes tell people the best feature on the, on the, on the smartphone is the off button. I think sometimes, I was on a, a ship one day and said, I can't get away from this phone. I said, there's a button here you can push. <laughs> you know? But we are connected all the time. Technology is embedded in everything we do. We have smart everything except perhaps governance and leadership, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence, maybe could do some of the normal one, but what's happening with machine learning and deep learning is really quite interesting. I, I'm not going to get into the discussion, are we going to have a, have a digital utopia or a digital dystopia, but it's certainly very interesting where we're going with this stuff. We are becoming increasingly embedded in everything technology does. I mean, there's technology around us that knows what we're doing and doing stuff with us. Everything is a service. If I was reporting a company, I wouldn't, I wouldn't contemplate building a data center, I don't think. I mean, we've never been very good at it. <laughs> and what we need to look at now is how we use the technology to create value, not run data centers. Other people know how to do that better. Data about everything in analytics for anyone. And that brings me really to think, thinking digital. I thought, okay, digital. I went, when, when we started talking about the digital economy, I thought, that's great. We're not talking about information technology anymore. We're talking about digital. The business understands that. But unfortunately, the business says digital equals technology. They're still thinking this is about technology. It's not. It's about the business. Digital as a team effort is becoming a mantra these days. But also, it's not just about the business. It's about a fundamental change of mindset. It's about a change of behavior, about how we look at technology. And it's about, that brings us back to thinking digital. And it's about get moving away from this focus on technology, beyond a technology delivery mindset to a business value mindset. Our focus still is on delivering the technology, and then a miracle occurs. Right? Well, it doesn't. We have to do a whole bunch of stuff. In fact, the reality of value, the problem starts with the sales process. I, um, you can read that, I don't want me to go through it, but I, I, I talked to my doctor a few years ago, and I said, well, how come you, you don't have electronic <laughs> records here? How come you have papers everywhere? She said, well, one, it costs me a whole lot of money to do it. Two, it takes a lot of time. But three, none of the vendors understand what I do. They don't understand what I do. I, I'm part of something called the Value, Value Selling and Realization Council. And the biggest issue is that the salespeople don't understand the business they're selling into. And they don't have the time to do it. Uh, if you, when you do sell it, stand, if you've seen the standard surveys which have been going on for the last bit, the, the, the success rate of projects which they've now included value in is, has been hovering around 30% for as long as we've been tracking it. That's pretty abysmal. It's a, it's about the same level, by the way, as employee engagement across the world, which is another issue. Um, so we haven't really improved that. And I can guarantee you, if I, if I go in to look at why a project has failed, it will be one, because it was managed as a technology project. Two, there was no user engagement and involvement. Three, there was no clarity of the outcomes they were trying to achieve. And four, there was no accountability. <laughs> and I could write that before the thing started. And, and, and the, the, the gentleman on cybersecurity before I talked about, we keep doing the same things. I think it's someone, I think it might have been Einstein, said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. We continue to do the same things. If anyone watches the public accounts committee hearings in the UK, the, everyone is the same <laughs> and they never learn. I, told them, I, I said they should put the public account committee when the, when the proposal comes in <laughs> and, and when the proposal is approved and not at the end when it's screwed up the way they know it's going to get screwed up. And it's going to get worse. McKinsey said, you know, most organizations have only a basic grasp on the value that, 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 that can, be, can be delivered by digital. They only have a basic grasp currently on the value that can be digital, di delivered before that. And they need to understand that it's a lot more than about digital. I had an aha moment when I was working with IBM. I went to a, a, a SIM conference in the Napa Valley. It was a tough choice, but had to go. Um, and they, 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 there was a guy there who used a, 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 tech, a, a model called the Levitt's Diamond, which I'm sure no one here really remembers. It doesn't really matter. But a guy called Michael Scott Morton d talked about an MIT 90s framework. And he talked about how organizations are structured and how they, how they actually deliver their work and value is a combination of strategy, the, the alignment between strategy, structure, and management processes, roles, and technology. And, uh, and that was a aha. I was 
at that time leading the development of a strategic planning methodology for Fujitsu. And I thought, we're going to have to change this thing. So the whole thing said, yes, you can, look at the, you can look at the technology, but you also have to understand these other changes. It's not about a technology, it's about technology-enabled change. And that was in 1989 that we put that, that, that methodology out. In, 19, in uh, 1998, we, we twiddled that a bit into a slightly different framework, but the same elements, and published a book called The Information Paradox, which introduced something called the Benefits Realization Approach. I'm not going to bore you with that today. No, well, I <laughs> might, but, <clears throat> but it, it said, you know, we've got to manage, look at an investment view of this, you've got to manage portfolios of business change programs which include technology and other projects. You've got to manage those over the full life cycle. You've got to have accountability and measurement. And that, that's kept me busy for the last 20 years. But we haven't really moved. And now we are moving into a different world, this whole digital ecosystem. And again, smart, 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 smart everything. Time of disruption, you know this, I don't really have to read it, but, but uh, digital business, the bolt-on strategy won't work. Putting, putting lipstick on, on the analog pig is not going to make it happen. But that's what we're doing in most cases. We need to invest in new capabilities and new business models. Change is becoming increasingly complex. When I started, it was an automation. I call it the appliance era. You know, you could buy a toaster, you could buy a thing. They didn't have to talk to each other. They worked independently. They were pretty easy to operate. The Fortune 81 had three buttons, a red one and a green one. I understood that. There was a yellow one, too. If you hit that at the wrong time, it broke. But that was another topic. Then we moved into the so-called information era, which then I called, I called that the rewiring era. It's starting to connect things. The connectivity which became more important. Then into a transformation era. I think a name is probably much abused. I think some of the transformation we've seen really wasn't transformation. We're going to see it now. And now, going back to Jerry in a way, we're in the exploration era. We don't really know where we're going. We don't know the questions to ask, but we know we're going somewhere. <laughs> and it's going to be very different. When you're, in the, when you're in the automation era, if you go to the work of David Snowden, not the Snowden who's in Russia, but the other David Snowden with his Synthin framework, in the automation area, you have simple ordered systems. There's one way of doing it. When you get into the information and some of the transformation stuff, it's, uh, it's complicated. There are, there, there are ways of doing it, but there are multiple ways of doing it, and you have to know which one will work for you. When you get into the complex arena, there are, um, there are emerging practices. We don't even know what we have to do. So you can use best practices, a term I hate. David Sinifin calls it, calls it past practices, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or you can use proven practices up here, or we have, we're having emerging practices. If you apply best practices, this is now we're getting to chaos theory, if you apply best practices to a complex environment, it results in chaos. But we keep striving for, be for best practices. We have to understand, we have to evolve into what we're going to do. The challenge of value is that the major contributor to value is not the technology, it's the organizational change that technology both shapes and enables. Increasingly complex change. And we have to, I say it's giving rise to, it is in certain circles, but it's not general. We have to rethink governance, which is a sort of, it's like the architecture word governance, everyone's eyelids shut, you know. But ultimately, I mentioned before, if you look at the failure of all of those IT projects, every one of them is a failure of governance. And if we don't fix that, we're gonna have a lot of failures going forward, and they're going to be much more critical. So we've got to change the way we do that. We've got to go beyond tweaking or re-engineering to re-imagining. If, we, if, we, if I hear any more, you know, is it the, should we do the CTO or the CDO, or who's going to run this thing? I, I don't bugger that. Why don't, we, why don't we go ahead and look at what the future's going to look like and the skills and roles we need instead of just shuffling names? I used to think it was okay because there's only three-letter acronyms, and now we have four-letter acronyms. So that the C-suite will all be C-somethings at some point. Someone's got to get on and do it. Yeah. Uh, now, why has he put this up? Well, mainly just to see if you're awake, but I, 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 I'm, I don't swim, and I'm a kayaker. Tells you something about me. But I, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely thing to do. It's a great way to think. But, uh, and that's a picture I did take in my, my, actually in my kayak. But I'm coming back to the word governance, this boring word. Governance actually, it, governance comes from a Greek word, meaning to steer a ship or to orient. And if any, how many people here are boaters? Oh, good, because I, I won't get caught up by too many people. Okay, so if you were going on a trip, um, so you, you're, you're going to take your boat out on a trip and you want to go up here somewhere, 
Uh, first of all, you say, just tell me where you want to go. By the way, that is a problem in governance. Remember the f f one of the major issues, a lack of clarity of the outcomes. I've had, I've had executives say to me, we didn't get the value we expected from that investment. I said, well, what value did you expect? I don't know. <laughs> well, possibly that's the problem. <laughs> and, they, and they keep doing it. Okay. So you tell me where you want to go, and then you, you, you plot your course, and, and that these little circly things are called, are called uh, fixes. You take a fix about every hour uh, to see if you're well. Actually, they're called dead reckonings when you plot the course, where you expect to be in intervals of about an hour. So then you, you go off and you get going, and you, uh, in an hour you take a fix. <laughs> Not that sort of fix, unless you've hit a rock, <laughs> unless you've hit a rock already. But, um, and guess what? You're not going to be where you thought you were. What do you do? Well, I've had so many people tell me, exactly, well, I know we're not on track on this project, John, but I'm hoping it's going to get better. The last time I looked, hope wasn't a method, you know. <laughs> and if you do that in a boat, it's probably not a very good idea. So what you do is you say, okay, where am I? Why am I not where I thought I was? Can I get back on course? Or do I have to plot a different course? Can that still get me where I want to go? Or do I plot a different outcome? Or do I pack up and go home? <laughs> That's governance. We don't do that. <laughs> You know, we don't, we don't, we only, we, we well, someone said at, at a conference once, we, we, we confuse the scorecard with the game. We just look at the scorecard. We don't notice how the plays are being made. We, we're never going to get on the scorecard. The minute you're, something's going differently, you've got to do something. But we don't do it. We go and then we audit it and we say, oh, yes, we'll do better next time. We do the same stuff. It's, it's all about managing an uncertain journey to an uncertain destination. That's not saying you don't know where you want to go when you start. And you don't think you know how you're going to get there, but you won't, it won't be the way you thought you got there, and it may not be where you thought you were going. So you have to manage that, including going back home. And it's getting cloudier. We're managing an uncertain journey to an unknown destination now, because we don't really know where we're going to end up, which is why I go back to the exploration thing. Okay. Too many organizations still fail to understand and, and apply technology effectively. I mean, it, it's still thought to be about technology. I know that a CEO of a large resource company in, in Canada said to me, I know this stuff's difficult, John, but I'd rather just run the plant. Well, it's running your plant, so possibly you ought to understand, and it's running even more now, okay? And, and I mentioned debating CMOs and CDOs. There was a CEO, years ago, there was a CEO, what, 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 there was a chief electricity officer years ago. Do you know that? Anyone here have a chief electricity officer? I mean, we just take it for granted, right? If someone is being supplied to us, we might have a backup generator or something, but we don't have a chief. We, we learn how to use electricity, and we use it effectively. We don't produce the damn stuff. Well, so maybe we do co-produce it now, but we're not, it's not our primary business. We've got to get out of this thinking. It's industrial governance in a digital world, okay? We need, we've, we've heard a lot about big data and, and analytics and value. We need a value-focused data and analytics driven, agile sense and respond approach to governance, not from the guys top down. I mean, you can't get decisions in time today. It's, it's ridiculous. I am, um, and I, I met Tom Peters a few years ago, and uh, I was working with a large US organization at the time, and I said to Tom, I said, you know, my experience with large organizations is that 10% of the people get the work done despite the other 90. <laughs> and he said, try five. You know, we've got a, the, the, we, have a, we have an industrialized mindset that says the leaders, the leaders know everything, the guys doing the work don't know anything, because in those days they weren't literate, and the managers sort of make sure they do what we tell them. Well, actually, the people at the bottom know more about it now, probably, than the guys at the top. And they don't really need managers telling them what to do. <laughs> we need to totally rethink what this is. I think we need to rethink governance. I said I need a more agile. We need to rethink leadership. Leadership should go beyond being an anointed hierarchical position to a behavior throughout the organization. And it's like the project teams in the old days. You know, it's, uh, depending on what's being done, a different person may be leading the team at different stages. There are different leader leadership qualities. We don't have to create more Cs. We have to tap in. The two, the two most underutilized assets that most organizations have are information and their people. We have the 30% engagement rate of people in work across the world today. 30% of the people feel engaged in their work. They're not allowed to use their brains. <laughs> They're just being told what to do, and they know it's the wrong thing <laughs> because they know there are better ways to do it. 
By the way, when I was not a millennial, when I was, when I was, a, when I was a computer operator, we knew there was a better way too, but we could only talk to two or three people in a pub. These guys can talk to thousands of people across the world. <laughs> they know there's a better way. They know they can do things better. And they know they can be allowed to work in a different way because technology allows that to happen. You know, digital leadership, genuine employee involvement it remains unusual. That was Peter Senji a few years ago. Most of our leaders don't think in terms of getting voluntary followers. They think in terms of control. Control is killing us in most organizations. And Stephen Denning, who's in the, with the Drucker Institute, says, you know, there's massive advantage for firms that have mastered the art of getting things done through responsible autonomy. It's like holacracy. I don't know what you want to call it. It's not going to be easy, but we have to think of flatter, more networked, more collaborative organizations if we're going to take advantage of the digital technologies. But also, the digital technologies enable us to do that. <laughs> We've got collaboration systems and systems that can tell us, help people work together and tell us if they're doing what they want, we want them to do and intervene if necessary. We need to change the mindset. I came back to that word. This came for me from, <clears throat> I was talking at an APM conference a few years ago, and a professor from Bristol got up and said, John, <clears throat> I, I, I love your book, I use your book, but it's never going to work because we've got two minds. We've got a, a logical IT mindset, and we've got an emotional leadership mindset. <laughs> so we've got to change the mindsets around here to be a value mindset. And, and we've got to rethink the role of leadership and managers in this thing. So the key messages I'd like to leave here are digital is, is, digital is changing the global and social context within which we live. It's a totally different world. It's not that we can't just keep tweaking it. It's a totally different world. And I'll go back to the word I had before. We have to reimagine what the world could look like. Let's stop arguing about whose job is it, the CMO or the CTO or the CDO. What needs to get done and where's the best place to do it? And why are we doing stuff that other people can do better for us? Why don't we put our effort in learning how to use this stuff to create value? The industrial reorganization is becoming a hindrance, not a support, to creating and sustaining value in, in, the, in our lives today. In the public sector, it's a nightmare, but that's a different, that's a, a big issue. But, but in any large organization, I used to say that the minute you organize, you're sowing the seeds of destruction. Because as, 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 as an organization gets bigger, the focus turns this way. <laughs> it turns to how do I move up the organization? How do I play the game? And they lose sight of why you're there in the first place. So we need to go from big organizations to more collaborative ecosystem networks. And we can do that. Digital organizations require more agile and inclusive approach. We need to let people use their brains again. Why are people disengaged? Because they don't allow to use their brains. They do what they're told. They don't agree with what they're being told to do. The driveway decision in the morning or the railway decision in the morning is not pleasant. They'd rather stay in bed. That's a huge untapped resource. And I'm not going to get into the, the job loss issue, which is another thing going forward. But we need to re-engage our people. And that's going to take very different governance and very different leadership than today. And everyone in this room has a role to play. Because this is, this is a quote here, leadership can come from everywhere, it comes from anywhere, it comes from a friend of mine, Don Tapscott, who some of you probably know or have heard of. By the way, that's a picture of Jeremy's office in the El Cavango Delta. He's in the tent sending data up. But we all need to show leadership. I think when I was a, a computer operator, I'd have hated to be my manager. Because when I was on night shift and didn't have a lot to do, I'd write memos to my manager about what was wrong and what he needed to do about it. You know, that was leadership. That was a pain in the neck, but, but we can do that. It's a very different world. And I wish I was significantly younger because I think it's a great world. It has great potential. There's an opportunity to really improve how we live as individuals, how, we live, how businesses perform, and how we live as societies. But it's going to take doing things very differently. It's just not going to happen if you throw technology at it. We've got to have a different governance and leadership around that technology. It has great promise, but only if we rethink how we do things. Thank you. <laughs>